So I'm going to try and explain via these five stories how these things interact. I just want to take you back to the context. All this started in the 60s, and it started with the call of cliches. It's very hard, I think, in front of any of us who were there to remember what it was like to first see an image of the planet Earth from space. And perhaps for those who are familiar with the image, subsequently hard to imagine why this cliche made such an impact at the time. But suddenly seeing a different view. Now, Buckminster Fuller had been taking a global view since the 30s. So it wasn't as if the thinking was new, but he was, what he had to say fell largely on deaf ears. Nine Chains to the Moon sets out very clearly that there is an impending social and environmental crisis, and it sets out very clearly a strategy for approaching it. It's only one of many strategies, but it went largely unnoticed, particularly by the architectural profession, on whose ears it might most usefully have fallen. However, the proportion of people taking a notice, because he talked about um, the spaceship Earth, when people started to see these images in the 60s of the Earth from space, suddenly it all started to make sense, at least for a few more people. So there's a huge upsurge of interest in thinking and taking a global view in the 60s. And that's sort of part of the context of the, of the beginning of our journey. So we need to know where we started from. Um, Fuller later announced, of course, that the, the problem with the Earth was it didn't come with an operating manual. So he said about writing one. And if you have never read this, it's one of his most approachable and readable books. It's clearly been gone over by somebody else. It's not full of voice, as it were. Um, and, and, it, and it establishes that there are clear principles that could be followed. The problem, again, was there was no sort of debate about this. Fuller only puts forward one particular view, and nobody really challenged it, apart from those people who said there wasn't a crisis, and there wouldn't be a crisis. And of course, they're still going on saying that. The other event, of course, that made a deep, deep impact on us was landing on the moon. These are my actual television pro photographs. Um, we got these bleary um, images from space. And it, it again changed the perspective, the notion that we could look at what we were doing. Now, the thrust of these lectures is not particularly to do with the environmental impact at all. I should emphasize that. It's, in a way, the motivation. I think that there, um, for those who come a little bit late, let me just explain that there are five interrelated viewpoints being taken in this lecture. Those of the, the citizen or the user of buildings, uh, that's going to be contrasted with the architect's perspective, and that's going to be contrasted with the perspective of the building itself, of the construction, and that's going to be contrasted with the views of the computer. Uh, we'll have to explain why the computer is entitled to have a view, but most importantly with the view of the environment. But the environmental crisis is only kind of like the imperative to do things faster, hence the title, which is Accelerating Architecture. My argument that, that, that things need to be, do, be done faster, and all these different aspects interrelate to give one or more possible ways forward. Now, I'm only going to describe one way forward, but that does not mean to say, and I'm absolutely clear, that it's the only way. And curiously enough, there were groups um, who took these issues seriously. And it's interesting, the title, but only one Earth. Um, however, maybe it's an interesting thing. This has come from the United Nations, no less, but it's an unofficial report. Somehow, there was a hesitation by got bodies such as the United Nations to feel that, that, that they could do anything about these issues officially. And this was partly because of the specific opposition from, from strong countries like the United States. Um, and partly because somehow it had this overtone as if somehow it wasn't serious science. Now all that, of course, has changed, and, and, and the gradual, we've got gradual changes and we've got repeats. And part of the rest of the context in the 60s was that there were two kinds of architecture going on. Um, there was the archigram movement, and just pick on this fairly typically, there was archigram and then there were conferences that brought all the key participants together. 1966, this is the Experimental Dialogue of Architecture at Folkestone, was a crucial date. Then this was a conference 
which was meant to attract a very, or expected to attract a very small number of people indeed. <laughs> However, in the event, and the speakers were to include Fuller, who actually wasn't able to turn up at centre spokesman, it included members of Archigram, it included like Claude Verilio, Paul, ba and Paul Verilio, Paul Paul, that included um, people like Cedric Price, Rainer Bannum, and so on. And, and, and it attracted thousands of, of students. The whole of, of Folkestone Beach was covered with backpacking students. There were about 3,000 turned up into a conference room which could best seat two or 300. It produced an amazing event which for, stands as a sort of symbol of the, of the moment when, when at least for, for a group of people, some people thought things needed to change. Back to Fuller, though, for a moment. Fuller, we, again, I was explaining a few minutes ago that, that he, he wrote the, the notion that there could be an operating manual for the spaceship Earth, and other books, of course, which describe the background, the background problem. And, but but in, in the 60s, and particularly around the date of just before the world, the, that conference in Folkestone, he founded the World Design Science Decade. Now, there are several things to observe about this. First of all, he argued that the world's problems could only be solved by architectural students and design students. And his argument was because they were the only people who got a generalist education. Everyone else was trained to be increasingly specialist. And as they became increasingly specialist, in Fuller's eyes, they became increasingly useless. This meant that all the most intelligent people had basically marginalized themselves, and this he saw as a, as a conspiracy. He was somewhat paranoid about this, but maybe correctly. And leaving only the most stupid people, which he regarded as the politicians, to do the general guy's decisions. So he said, we had to change all this round. And the only group that's an exception to this are architectural design students, because they're taught to be comprehensive thinkers. So uh, he, uh, he tried to. Um, mobilize the architectural students of the world to um, make a study. Um, if you, these documents, there are six in this series, produced over the 10 year period, where he documented availability of energy and materials and documented strategies for trying to make much more efficient and effective use of these materials and started talking very much about things in um, in terms of ecological cycles, recycling materials, in terms of total energy systems. And that point of view, it was very good. And, and there was a, a, a famous meeting in this period in London, again, heavily attended. Fuller, Fuller spoke for four hours without notes and without drawing breath. Um, his style of, of talking was quite interesting. He would sit at the front on the table with his legs dangling, and, and he, he would try and look at a kind of current problem, even ask people in the room what was the, what was the most important problem they could think of. And, and he would use that then to bring to bear, and he had about 20 dominating concepts and 20 key questions in his mind, which are actually documented in these volumes. And he would bring these concepts to bear on whatever the problem was. Um, his other strategy in lectures, which was somewhat disarming, um, was to turn to someone at the front of the audience and say, Madam, how much does your house weigh? <laughs> say, Madam, how much does your house weigh? Well, of course, they could never answer this. And then try again. How, what's the world's copper resources? Well, of course, nobody ever knew that answer either. And so how many people are in the world? Well, sometimes people could guess that. It's around, then around about six billion. And then he would divide the total world's copper resources, which of course I can't remember either, by the world's population and come to some answer, let's say 10 kilos per person, for sake of argument. And he'd then say, what does all the copper in your house weigh? And they were, of course wouldn't know the answer. So he would say, well, about 100 kilos. How do you justify using 10 times your share? And so on. This was the kind of thing. So he had these kind of provocative questions. But they were to do with saying, well, at the moment, the way we're constructing things is not um, sustainable politically or ecologically. And politically, particularly, because everyone is going to aspire to uh, Western standards of living. And they can't do it by using building the way we construct. So he set about this task of trying to make more efficient use of materials and more efficient use of energy 
and used to give people a slice of the cake problem, where you were given a notional site which contained your fair share of desert, sand, ice, uh, sea, lakes, uh, and so on, and, uh, and your share of, of, the, of the notional share of the world's resources and energy intake, and say, well, what are you going to do about this as a designer? Can you design within your available resources? And if not, how are you going to justify your actions? Which is quite an interesting and provocative set of questions. Now, the downside of this, there's a downside to this too, which was, I think, the very idea that this was design science. About that time, um, the Bartlett switched from teaching everyone to do rendered drawings of neoclassical columns. This was in the year 1963. Can you believe? We're talking in the 60s. They were still you still learned to do architecture by rendering classical columns. They switched to instead doing what they call design science, and this was not particularly connected with Fuller. It was just the term, and the term really meant that somehow you could study architecture scientifically. Well, actually, that was no better than studying it by drawing columns of the Renaissance because they did these elaborate calculations and then would find that they had to set their desk at 17 degrees to the window to get ideal light conditions. But that, of course, wasn't going to get anybody anywhere. And at that same time, I was at the Architectural Association a student, and they started building wind tunnels and laboratories for testing acoustics and daylight and all the rest of it, um, which was fine. There's nothing wrong with that, except that it was out of its context. That was, it wasn't within the context of problems to which it could be a solution nor was it part of some methodology which would, would help you actually improve design. So there was the strength and the weakness. The strength was the idea of mobilizing the students of the world to do something about these problems and raise the conscious level. And the downside was that somehow the, the, it would come from, from this notion of, of design science, or comprehensive design science, Fuller called it. It's worth just mentioning his globe for a moment. The po point about this is not that it folds up into an icosahedron. It's that when you unfold, you can unfold it different ways. And depending on how you unfold it, this particular unfolding is called the one earth version. And this one tends to give you, uh, or gives you, one, one, um, one sort of continuous land mass. There are other ways of unfolding it to give you one sea mass. So it makes all the world look like an island, a string of islands strung out round one big ocean. So it's all a question of which panels you unfold relative to which. But he used these maps in those world design science decade to map world resources, world literature, world fuel movement, and so on, with a series of a very evocative diagrams to set the problem. And simultaneously with that, um, what we're imbued with in architecture is um, a modernist image. So we have, on the one hand, Fuller talking about a amount of resources and, and an approach which is, which is um, politically and socially um, dry, driven, but and technologically driven. And we have a very strong other dominant school of architecture, which is driven by imagery, imagery of ocean liners, images of new technology, but not the actual new technology. So into all this context, um, that's, that's just basically setting the scene. Into that context, um, we felt that the architecture, as we knew it, as a discipline, wasn't going to provide the answer to any of these problems. And I just indicated some of the reasons why, why it might not. And so instead, we coined the word an um, auto, auto tecton, and I'm going to explain in a moment what that, that word means. But for the moment, just contrast it with architecture, and the explanation will follow. And it contained, that was actually my thesis project, and it contained, I'm just still trying to set the background, um, all kinds of concerns. This is, for example, this is one random page. Um, it's called Toothpaste Theory of Architecture. This was to do with a major problem about the way in which architecture was described historically and the preoccupations of architectural historians and their complete lack of any interest in the user, in the social context, in the technology. All they were really interested in it as a progression of, of styles. Things were seen stylistically. Things were interpreted purely in visual terms. Now, I have nothing wrong with that. It's the only thing that gives me the problem. It's the only. No mention, no mention of, of, the, of the social conditions. 
And if you look at the bookshelves of those period, that period, there were very few books. It was a social history of art could be found, but very little that impinged on any technical issues or any constructional issues or any social political issues or any environmental issues or any resource issues. So I'm just going to, typical student projects at this time consisted of making little kits of things, parts of things that were going to fit together to somehow give more choice and flexibility. This was very much a, a kind of kit of parts type mentality that, that flowed through the schools of architecture at that time. Um, making all the time little, little, little kits of parts which would increase flexibility, choice, better use of materials. And things that were flexible and mobile would fold and unfold and, and, and provide alternatively. But basically there was a fundamental problem with all these things, that they were still um, attacking it in artifactual um, and architectural terms. Now, there's an example of mine here, which I'm going to show several times in these lectures as a kind of litmus test paper. It was in the Buckminster Fuller tradition, very much a structural system. It was uh, meant to be lightweight, use very little materials, big, make big spans, thereby uh, achieving um, the kind of efficiency levels that were necessary to, to build buildings within the available resources. Two simple folded plate structures juxtaposed back to back, very easy to make, and two of those together um, giving you a vocabulary of parts. But it was still within this kit of parts mentality. And of course, I was still making these silly little plastic bits that stuck together to, to form them. Now, I, I'm going to come back to this several times. But this first time, um, I'm just going to use it to explain why I got into computing, because that's also going to be relevant. Um, it was the sheer labor of sticking all those little bits of plastic together. I, had, I made 40,000 of them. And I had to hand trim them with a knife, and I could only do 12 an hour. You can work it out. Um, so I, I decided there had to be some better way. The first attempt was to invite the first year students. I was, and um, I got, I recruited a whole of the first year of the AA that year to help me make some of these models. This was an altogether total failure because, of course, they made it all wrong. However, it was a very interesting social experiment. Tables of people wondering what on earth they thought they were doing with these silly little bits of plastic roof. Anyway. <clears throat> that drove me to, to early attempts at computation as what would seem to be a, a, a solution. However, and this is the point I'm going to come back to on, on day four, um, there was no software. So, I mean, this is interesting. This is Cambridge University, 1970. 1970, and it's the only graphics display device in Cambridge University at that time. It's a circular cathode ray tube, and the light it's not a storage tube, so the light, the, the, the cathode ray beam is driven continuously round it, and so the beginning of the drawing fades before the end is being driven. It is, of course, a real computer. It even has little flashing lights like, a, like a, one of the movies, and the bootstrap is literally a strap of, of paper tape. Um, you know, if you had to re reboot your computer, that's where the word came from. And it was literally a, a piece of tape you fed in to start the machine. But what's interesting about that is if you look in issues of architectural design, this is where it's very sad that Sam Hardingham's not here this morning, can't be here. For those who came in late, she's broken her wrist. Um, ice skating. It's actually not enough, but that's all right. Um, and, and Sam wrote her, uh, edited an issue of AD recently on the 70s. Now, what's interesting, if you look at the ADs of the period preceding this, that's right through the 60s, the period you would get the impression that every architect was doing everything by computer-aided design, and every building was being built by computer-controlled numerical equipment. It just wasn't true. There weren't any. There were only very big brain frames which were difficult to access. And when you got to them, they were almost impossible to program. Very, very difficult indeed. When I was a student and trying to get off, that, off my plastic modeling kit bit of thinking, um, to do it, you had to write every line of software yourself. And that was extremely tedious. And, and I didn't, there wasn't, that cathode ray tube was 1970. I was doing this in 1967, and there wasn't even a screen. So when you went to the plotter, you'd find it would plot the whole thing here, a little pool of ink off the, off the paper, or it would do a two or three lines right across it, because there was no screen preview. So you got no way of, of debugging or finding what, what, you would, what was going wrong. So, and again, like all these early things, they all have the, they all have the, 
the, the potential to solve the problem, but not the reality. The, the potential was that the computer could automate all sorts of things. However, the problem was there wasn't any software that enabled you to do that. And I've eventually found the final drawings. During this process of trying to put this lecture together the weekend, I found by chance these. These drawings were stolen from the end of year exhibition. They were the very first um, student project ever to be drawn by computer, and they were stolen. But we found these photographs. See, they were very badly photographed in the exhibition with bad lighting. And those were the actual traces of the computer, complete with that bugs, errors. Spectacular error here. Um, but it was a very, very painful process. Now, there's a surprise here for those of you who know this project and have seen it before. And what nobody knows is we built it. Um, this is, we kept a, a, a long, long and dark secret. This is the testing of the structural theory, and this is actually constructing, and I'll say more about that later. Um, um, so these are real projects. Now, David Green um, announced a moratorium on building, and, and that, well, David's doing the talk on Thursday evening, and we're going to raise that issue, because as a result of that moratorium, I, I too, imposed a moratorium and, and, and stopped doing this kind of thing. Now, um, this is just another image from that same thesis. I'm just, that all that stuff that you've just seen, apart from the actual construction, the last two pictures, were in that final year's thesis. And so too, most importantly to me, was this diagram of DNA. The question was, what, what did it mean and how is it to be interpreted? And it made me make a mental switch for between these two images. It seemed to me that, that the box of bits approach was fundamentally ill-conceived, and what we needed was something more like the packet of seeds approach. Instead of designing these silly plastic bits and things that I'd been doing for several years, thinking I was addressing a useful problem, I needed to design, or we needed to design, or everybody needed to design, something that had the power of the coding that existed in DNA. So what I've really tried to do in the last few minutes is set the background against what then happened, because what then happened was basically trying to do that, trying to think how it would be if your problem as an architect wasn't to design one-off um, buildings or even boxes of bricks, but was to design seeds that would then grow and develop and evolve and so on. And that was the self-imposed problem to which I will, I will um, uh, allude from time to time during these, these, this series. Now, going back to autotectonics, this made-up word, um, we talk about the art <coughs> and science of technology, of, of autotectonics, and the environmental and social imperatives. Now, I've hinted about the environmental imperatives. I so far haven't touched much on the social ones, because that's the subject of, of what I'm going to say in a moment. But why a self-organizing architecture? Well, that's more of a speculation. Um, I think what you have to do with everything I'm going to say is, you, you know, you, you won't accept the whole of what I'm going to say as a sort of package, and you don't have to. What I'd like you to go away with is the feeling that, that what I say about the interrelationships between things is valid. Um, and I will try and differentiate between things which I think are applied to everybody and things which I think are very personal. I think the environmental and social imperatives to change things applies to everybody. I see that as inescapable. However, that does not mean to say that it has to be for a self-organizing architecture. There could be alternatives. And I'd be very interested to hear around the room, either today or later in the week, what other ideas people have about self-organizing architectures or alternatives to self-organizing architecture. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, and, of course, you don't have to go along with this made-up word, autotectonics. I'll just explain what that means. Um, what I'm going to argue is that we have to see building as being part of the whole environment in an embedded way. That's that we can't actually separate creating a building from thinking about where did all the materials come from, where is the energy coming to power it? Where are all the waste products going to go? Where is the waste heat going? And so on. We've got to see it as part of a system, and a part of a system that's integral to the very shaping of the planet's future. 
you can tell from the daily headlines and the, and the manic changes in the climate that, that we have already significantly affected our environment. And it's important to realize that buildings are responsible for almost 50%, or according to some people, more than 50% of the use of energy. So given such an enormous impact of buildings, you could argue this is already the situation. What I'm trying to say is that it should be dealt with consciously. And I think, and this is again a personal view, that we're going to get a new kind of designed artifact that emerges from this interaction. And I'm calling this process autotectonic. So this is my own personal word. You don't have to use the word, but it's just convenient. So when I use autotectonics, that's what I'm meaning. This self-organizing process that achieves new kinds of artifacts through that evolving process. And the word itself, how does it come from? Um, it's the, um, this is my definition, the art and science of designing and creating, self-generating, self-organizing, self-sustaining, evolving systems. It's the technology of independent living systems, and it comes from the Greek auto, and technikos building, same as architecture. And I'm saying these systems can be social, political, economic, I'm, I'm obviously, I'm applying it primarily in what I'm talking about into architecture and planning. This was also a bit of a reaction against, ooh, architecture, epitomized by, epitomized by, this, that was meant to be my symbol of, a, of, a, of a, the control freak mentality of architecture. Arch is a control freak word. Arch, this is from the dictionary, in terms of odium, meaning out and out worst of. Archdevil, archdeacon, arch anything, bishop, controlling, architect. Whereas auto has this nice feel for me about doing it for yourself independently. And it has this overtone in the English language of being a living element always. So that's the reason for my choice of this word, which you can use a lot as you wish. Now, this is what I think is going to happen, and I'm jumping the gun here, and I'm going to return to this slide on the last day and try and justify it. I'm showing it now just to set up um, what I'm going to be talking about so you're prepared. Um, the five key players, the architect, the user, the environment, the construction, the computer, I think have all got to shift ground. And if by shifting ground, I think they could all play a much more important role. I think the architect, and I'm going to explain what I mean by this um, next, tomorrow, um, he has to design, um, he has to go up, upscale and think in a much more generic way. Move away from being concerned with specific instances and move, design things which are much more like the packet of seeds. Now architects actually are quite good at thinking generically. Just think of the work of, just think of an, 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 any, well, any well-known architect, Frank Lloyd Wright. Think of his work. How would you immediately recognize a Frank Lloyd Wright building if you'd never seen it before? Immediately recognizable. Why? It's a bit more than just a stylistic similarity. It's a deeply embedded thinking about the spatial concepts, the way it's organized, its relationship with the site, the environment, the way it's used, and then the materials, and indeed the styling and so on. But it's something quite deep, and that's what I would call generic thinking. Most architects do think generically. Most architects do produce families of solutions. And so I don't think this is an unnatural move for architects to concentrate more on that, put their effort, and, and get away from this notion that it's, it's possible, possible at all, technically, to do one-offs. And I will deal with this issue by the time we get to lecture, I think it's three, <coughs> where I think I can argue that, and demonstrate that it's pretty well impossible in the future to do one-off buildings. And, uh, and they're going to be parts of families. So I'm suggesting the architect has to move, move territory, and move up and make space. If they do that, that leaves more space underneath for the user to play a stronger role in establishing preferences. And then to deal with the user in a moment. The user, the citizen, is the, the, the underdog of all this at the moment. And there must be ways in which they could be brought into more active roles. But, but I'm not saying that the user alone should dictate things, because I'm also going to argue that the environment should be an active participant in this process, not something passive, 
but something that actively interferes with the design process. And I'll explain how that could be done. The means of construction have got to change um, in two different ways. One, we're still talking about trying to do make better use of resources, better energy, and so on. That's I'm taking for granted. But also the actual construction using computer-controlled manufacturing equipment, using robotics, and we'll address that issue. And then the role of the, the computer. You'll discover I have no interest in using computers just for drawing. I got rid of that nonsense 30 years ago, or rendering. But as a, a, a catalyst and a, and a turbocharger to the whole process, the computer can compress um, space and compress time. Temple compression of space, spatial compression of time. By which we mean you can make models of things that are very big in a way which they can be handled in the environment, and you can compress time by doing billions and billions of virtual prototypes. Nature, and we'll talk about nature in lecture five, um, uh, is brilliant at making um, um, uh, endless, endless prototypes. But most of these prototypes fail and are just the food pile for the, the, the more successful experiments. Now, what we can do with computing is virtual prototyping. So I'm going to argue that using it as a virtual prototype has to do masses of iterative variations on ideas and develop them, and will allow us to perform the amount of acceleration that's necessary to deal with the environmental problems um, quick enough. This comes from this comes from a book called Chamberlain and the Beautiful Llama, for obvious reasons. It's, oh, it's known as the Lilliput Syndrome. There's a magazine called Lilliput, and Lilliput, maybe it still exists. It's American, I think. Anyone? Anyway, um, it, one of the things it used to do was have a little feature that juxtaposed images like this. So this is juxtaposing the Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain with the Beautiful Llama, hence the title of the book. Um, so the whole book is full of these juxtapositions. This is H.G. Wells, and an American scientist. Um, this is um, knitting on the left, and girls doing physical exercises on the, on the right, and so on. This is a whole book's full of these, right? And now, the problem is this, that that Lilliput thinking gets applied to other things. Here, it's intended as harmless fun. It was just a feature. Here, it's turning or pretending to be serious architectural criticism. I'm taking this example from Charles Jakes because I happen to like Charles and never I'm attacking, I'm attacking a friend here. This pertains to many, many books where there is some assumption based on visual terms that there is a connection. Jenks uses this pair of images in, in his lecture which, on the jumping universe and he talks about the fractal as if there is some real connection between that and the painting of the ice. So the, the, there is made a pseudo-scientific connection. Now he does it with this. This, for example, is one of the sets of an evolutionary sequence I shall show in a minute. When something like this gets described as blobby texture, then there's a serious problem. Because this is not a blobby texture architecture at all. This is a visualization of evolving data structure. It has got nothing to do with making buildings, or certainly not anything to do with making blobs. Here's another example. This is an interesting one, because it contains both elements simultaneously. At one level, it's fair play, because the computer model up here, there is an obvious, and it's been taken from this angle to show relationship between the computer model of the Disney Concert Hall and the final form. And indeed, as we'll talk about later, the, the very way in which these forms are constructed and controlled, the very fine tolerances on the bending of the titanium can only, only be done through the computer model. So that's perfectly fair. So the, the first point of any such visual comparison would be completely correct. That is dependent on that. This preceded that song. However, dear Charles goes into print to say that this is the first building in the world to be generated by computer. Not true at all. It was one of the first, and not even the first, but one of the first to be constructed from a computer model. That's not the same as generated. 
So when I'm going to be talking about generating things in this lectures, these lectures, I do not mean the process by which you simply make a computer-aided design model roughly like you might make any other and then build it from it. That is not the same thing at all. So we've got this problem all the time. And, it's, and Charles I'm picking on because he's a friend. Um, others, um, it's sometimes malicious. Mostly it's just lack of knowledge. Sometimes it, it's, it's just stupidity. But, but it's, the problem is there, which is that it bot takes the words and repossesses them. And all the time tries to build them back into this frame, of traditional frame of architectural theory and criticism. And you have the same problem even with the architects themselves, where uh, Corbusier is talking about forms, machine forms, machine aesthetics, borrowing forms from other vocabularies, like from the roof of the Marseille block, obviously borrowing uh, forms from, from um, maritime engineering, but not borrowing the technology. So again, it's just a visual connection, um, not a technical connection. And simultaneously with that, you have things coming out like a new society trying to suggest that there is a radical alternative to the notion of this architectural imposed order. And that cities might be better um, if they let things happen from the grassroots up. The other jarring contrast is between that sort of self-conscious design and the unselfconscious design, which is the greater part of the built environment. What are the qualities that we've forgotten to talk about? And of course, it's partly to do with, in fact, that very lack of control and formality produces the kind of environments that many of us find very conducive. I don't just mean in a picturesque sense. This is true of every country. That, of course, is Italy. This is China. These are different parts of China, each having a local indigenous vernacular architecture. Anywhere in the world, you can find this um, same preoccupation um, with, with a local vernacular. Now, let me just talk about um, Walter Siegel a moment. Um, because I think he, he managed to capture us in a very simple way some of those characteristics. These houses are in Lewisham in London. They're built, they're built by the people who own them and live in them. They're self-built. Um, they're a very simple timber framing system, very economic. This is two stories. You can see this is single story on a steep slope on, on, on Lottie. Lewis and Borough made the land available for this housing and, and gave help to support this idea. And so they were supported by the architect to, to deal with the design and the building regulations and the system. And the, builder, the owners themselves built them with their own hands. Somebody made this model. I think someone at Orm built this for him. There's the grid. These are simple little perspex panels, which enable you to put the panels in to, to, to help. But it's still an interface between the user and the architect. The user can play about with it, but still the architect's interpreting it. So for Walter, we built a very simple computerized version of that. It's the same idea. It's the same grid, same module, of course. But this time, there are little electronic components in the bottom of the perspex panels, which make the model machine readable. Um, the actual plan has been determined by the users. So anybody who can build a model, which is roughly speaking any child, also anybody can operate the computer because there's no visible keyboard or anything, you're just moving physical components about. So this changes that subtle relationship in a way which I'm interested in changing a great deal further. Um, the, the, that model was built quite literally on the kitchen table, a great deal of wire, special purpose wire computer, and this is it being tested. But from the model, and here it's deducing a single story plan, you don't have to do anything at all, works out all the bits, then it works out all the framing, so it does all the construction drawings, checks that it fits the building regulations, gives you a complete schedule of parts and all the prices, so then you can go back and iteratively change it. But you haven't invested all that painstaking process of, of, of architect's time, or painstaking AutoCAD time or anything else, it's just a, a model you play with. This is the... Um, EEPROM, the chip, the computer chip that has all his instructions on it. There's another one of these, which I'm going to show in a moment, for the generator for Cedric Price. And that one is, the actual chip, is in the Museum of Modern Art in New York, in a permanent collection, which is somewhat ironic um, for two reasons. One is they can't read it, so they're only interested in the chip itself like an iconic object. So this gives me some trouble, actually. However, 
it's quite amusing that, that, that they should exhibit something you can't actually see or read, knowing that inside it is the kind of architect's um, brain immortalized. Both, uh, both architects are sadly dead. This is um, um, from Neil Gershenfeld's Fab Labs. He's got a book called Fab. Fab stands for fabulous or Fab Labs, and Fab Labs stands for Fabrication Laboratories. Now, this is basically, um, as I've only said, taking this whole idea very much further. First of all, it's taking it not just to self-builders, it's taking it out. Uh, he has these in India, he has these in Africa, he has these all over the place, where he installs these little laboratories with about 12 sophisticated uh, computer-controlled pieces of manufacturing equipment. And by allowing very young children, and by making the software very easy, Neil is allowing uh, them, empowering them, to make quite sophisticated objects. So this is a kind of extension of the idea of self-design into self-make. And Neil, his view on this is that um, self-making in this way will become as common as things like, say, desktop publishing. The level now of a normal sort of documents coming out of anywhere is really, on the whole, quite sophisticated. And that's just because everybody is now um, empowered to make their own desktop publishing, so everyone can publish. And the internet has changed that even more dramatically. You can publish anything on the internet, and that starts to change the relationship between experts and how they get information, and it's starting to have an influence in politics. However, what he's talking about is getting the systems to make themselves. There's no reason why this machine can't make the other machines. You see what I mean? um, let me just show you this project, the generator project from, from Cedric. It's a little bit later. Uh, he, he was asked by Howard Gilman the, from the Gilman Paper Corporation to, to take this site in Florida and make it so it could be um, a flexible kind of camp for the uh, members of the company. The, what he, the proposition he came up with was that there would be little um, cells which could be moved around. The crane was to stay permanently on site. That was the intention. So that on a day-to-day -day basis, these parts could be arranged to, to, to match changing needs. So he asked us, that's Julian and myself, to write the computer software which would help organize this. So you would say what needed to be done, and it would come out with these plans showing where to put the parts to satisfy the, the particular requirements of the site that day. And then the crane would move all the parts accordingly. And this is a little simple interactive program. This was very early, this was 1978 or 79 we wrote this. And there were some interesting sort of twists of this, one of which was Ron Heron from Archigram came to see this. And Ron, again, because everyone thinks of Ron being very computerized, at that time he never actually sat down at a computer and, and interacted with it. Um, so there's, all, there's, there's, a, there's a time misfit all through this period, that we all think all these things happened in the 60s, but by 1978, 79, not even into the, it was round about the crucial date, is around about 1978, that the, the, the whole thing started to move onto the desktop. The notion of having a desktop computer like this was, was, was on the one hand, it was science fiction. On the other hand, from looking at any issue of AD, you think it had already happened. So again, we're going two stories at the same time, which don't tie up. But what Ron was absolutely fascinated, because he sat down, this is, I think this is supposed to be Ron's drawing, at least I hope this is. Um, and Ron was arranging these things pretty well by hand on the screen. Then he's using a joystick and clicking and putting moving things about. And he'd never done this before, and it was producing these little wireline perspectives for him, which are absolutely nothing now, but at the time he was absolutely thrilled, because this is coming up kind of immediately and instantaneously. But then he suddenly got frustrated, saying, well, the, the problem was he could only be Cedric Price. Whatever he did, he could only design a Cedric Price building. Because that was true of both the Walter Siegel system and the Cedric Price system. They had those rules embedded firmly into that system. They couldn't change it. Now then, we suggest that this slide tells about five stories together, which I need to, to, to um, unpack. First, let's just look at the, forget all this, let's look at this computer. This is a PET, Personal Electronic Transactor, and it was the first machine to reach the market which you could buy at a reasonable cost and you could own your own computer. Um, it had 8, 4K memory, the first 8K, this model, 8K, 8K? 
<laughs> You've probably got more computing power than that in your teeth, certainly in a watch. Um, um, it, unbelievable. And, and the storage is a tape recorder, an ordinary cassette tape recorder. That's its floppy disk system, as it were. And the keyboard is little square with the keys. And the screen resolution is 25 by 40. Um, but, 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 it was the first personal electronic transactor to, to actually arrive. And I saw this and I thought, this is extraordinary. That means every, within a year or two, every single architect could have their own computer system. And of course, no one believed me or anybody else who said that kind of thing. In fact, it only took about 12 years before every single architectural drawing board disappeared from the offices. It was very, very quick, the growth. But the resolution is so bad, you see, it's being done on the, drawn on the plotter. Laboratory plotter's been wired up to it. And this is drawing a little, a little perspective, which I'm sorry, it's a very poor resolution slide. This, though, is something quite different. This is a model of a small part of the Cedric Price generator project. This is just one tiny corner of the site of a 4x4 of a four four part of the grid. These represent the cubes. And what we did was to suggest that you put, this was a single chip microprocessor. Wasn't the first on the market. The first on the market was called the Tetrix 4051. The model is deciding where the different parts should go by the model talking to itself. And the idea was to do that full size, so that your actual full size parts of the of the of the building would be able to talk to each other. And that led to the to the um, notion that the building was in a sense intelligent. You have to be a bit careful. With these words, but 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 the sort of the architectural press, you like Dan, like like that kind of stuff, intelligent enough to be able to determine its own organisation. But there's another twist to this story. One of the worries was that the crane driver might put the bits in the wrong place, and then that the computer would lose track of where they were. Well, in this case, it would because when it went back down on its foundation plinths, it would know, just like the parts of the Walter Siegel model, it would know where they all were. So it was a machine, the whole building became a machine readable model of itself. But it also had the intelligence in it to negotiate. So these cells could talk to each other and decide what to do. Now that left us with too much computing power, and I said this many times before, but what happens if you've got too much intelligence is you get bored. So we built into this the notion of boredom, that the building would get bored with its own arrangement. And whimsically and willfully, this cube might be being, might have sent instructions to the crane driver to move it because it needed moving, or it might just have got bored overnight with being next to this neighbor. Now, there's a very serious point to what appears to be a facetious idea. The important points are this. First, that Cedric wanted to encourage people to change the building. They might not be used to that, so how do you get them to do that? And one way was to get them to move the parts, you know, for the parts to start moving themselves about, to kind of get this idea moving. But there's a much more serious intention in my mind, which was that um, we thought the building could learn how to do things better. We were programming, I mean, we, but, but based on what? You know, we were making kind of rules for this. And in a way, it was likely that over a period of time, the building might know best. Now, you know best about all kinds of things, but you've learned things through your senses, and you've learned things from feedback. So we decided that, first of all, that probably, this is a very um, fundamental statement I'm going to make, probably any computer program that we can write is too trivial to be worth using. I'll repeat that. Any program that we can write, that is we can design, is probably too trivial to be worth using. And then in future, we'll be in a world where most computer programs have learnt and developed on their own experience. By interacting with users and the world, they learn to do things better and write their own code better. It was our thinking that the building could probably learn to rearrange itself better than we could. And in order to do that, it had to have it, um, some feedback. So to begin with, it would provoke, it would be a provocative building, provoke the users into some kind of reaction that, that things had been moved. Thereby, A, answering Cedric's point that this would give them the feeling things changed about, and B, it would give the building some opportunity to learn from that feedback uh, that, that uh, there were better ways of doing things. So I'm now introducing another ingredient into the conversation and this could learn from the environment, just as it will, could from the reaction of people, that the kind of, um, the kind of future trajectory I'm trying to take you on um, includes the notion that buildings will be able to reorganize themselves and to organize themselves in response 
to both people and the environment. And that in order to do that, they will have to have some kinds of feedback mechanism. Um, now, that raises an issue about public participation in design. Um, this slide is from one of my PhD students called Yankee Lee. And Yankee um, um, has mapped here different participation <coughs> experiments around the world by location and date and, and ways of doing things. And this is all to do with the Walter Siegel thing, how to get the designers involved, how, how to get the users involved in the design process. And there's lots of different ways of doing it, and it's gone in fashions. There were waves of this. It went, and each time the same thing happened. Um, various um, people would kind of take it over and own it, and sort of possess it, and then turn it into a kind of like a design methodology, which was as rigid as the thing it was trying to, to replace. It was the sort of the Lilliput syndrome again, of, of a thing being a shadow of itself. But it won't go away. It keeps on coming up in different forms. Sometimes you interact by talking to people. Sometimes you interact with models. Sometimes you interact by people designing it themselves. Sometimes whatever, whatever, whatever. But we're still looking at ways, um, and it, it won't go away, and I don't think it ever will go away. But what is changing is, <coughs> attitudes are changing. If you change the idea about architects, and, and they work more generically, that would change it very dramatically. But this same idea, that you can go back and talk to people, comes up again and again and again. My own view is that this is always worth doing, but isn't the answer to the problem. I think you've got to empower people to interact much more directly with the, with the environment, not through the intermediary of architects. Now, I don't, my own view on this is that this is, this is what we should be doing anyway, or could have been doing anyway all along. And of course, some architects do indeed get involved in these kind of discussions. And this doesn't really radically change anything. But I think it's important to remember that this kind of activity is, I love the way it's like them playing Marchand. Um, I think we need something much more radical, but I, 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 it, I, I was trying to get you, get you on the same wavelength about what we're talking about. The other thing that happened was, of course, people on their state were pretty sociable anyway, but it got people from different parts of the state talking together, because the existing buildings are quite sort of defensive by floor, by block, and so on. So that, that, that all these things perform an additional kind of social dimension. And I noticed that the other one is Mark, for example, who's also been using planning participatory games in, uh, in his work. Have you, have you seen this before, Mark? This thing from Yankee? No. Okay. Get out of this. I can't move it's supposed to be. Um, so, the way she ran these works was for participation, communication, getting her hands dirty, and then trying to, trying to learn something that could be transferred back to the architect with people working between them and the architect as kind of facilitators. So it's one approach. Um, but I just want to mention briefly that there are other ways you can design things entirely. And um, this is like, this last few minutes is just by way of kind of opening the issue for, for, for the rest of the week. First of all, we haven't yet mentioned how nature makes form. And, um, and there are basically two fundamental processes. One is where things like ice crystals are, are formed entirely by a combination of the external situation, the temperature, the wind, the moisture, and the internal molecular structure, the atomic structure of the, of the water model of water. And th what you get is an outcome of, of these two, of these two pressure, pressures in a historical sense. But there's no memory in it and no intelligence in it. The other kind of way nature designs also contains an element of that. There is also an element of the crystal organization going on. But in this case, there are two other processes. Development is how you grow from one seed to a complex animal. 
from one spinach seed to a plant. That's that I'm going to call development. There are other words, epigenetic development, ontogeny, there are all kinds of biological words for this, but if we stick with development, it's easy. The other process takes place over very long time sequences, and it's how the goats evolve from some other species. That's evolution and takes place over a very long time scale. It had always been our intention to, to do something that sensed the environment and interact with visitors. And it was going to contain the idea of users interacting and the environment interacting, many of the things on my, on my hit list. But virtual visitors was one that was added at the very last minute. The idea was you could log in and you could try and change the genetic information um, remotely. And we made um, quite a primitive interface. That's what it looked like in January 1995. And it was a very, very complex piece of software. And I'm going to go back to this diagram and explain a little bit more about what actually happened. But just to show you that it was a whole series of cyclical processes. This cell, this single cell, first of all, it's just like the cubes I've shown. But cubes are very difficult because they have a lot of neighbors. A cube has 26 neighbors. And they have to talk to these neighbor spaces. And spheres are very elegant. They, they have this nice isotropic, isospatial, isomorphic, isotonic, isomeric uh, properties, which mean basically it's all the same in every direction, every way up, equal measures, equal everything, equal, equal, equal. And that means also that you've got just 12 neighbors. So 12 neighbors, very nice number of neighbors to talk to, and they're all of equal kinds. Those are the different messages coming in on the internet. This is the environmental message and the chromosomes uh, uh, being developed, which is controlling this cellular growth, in direct analogy again with the way the cells split in the body, and this is the visualization of that. I'm just going to show both these again. I showed them yesterday briefly, and I probably will show them one more time yet to make another point. Um, but here you can see quite clearly how that cellular division is, is happening, and that's in accordance with certain rules in, in there, which are affected by the environment. So where they're not growing, is to do with either it's a rule, like start to grow this arm, or it's to do with, say, environmental stunting or biasing that's occurring. I'll stop that one and show Whoops, sorry, I'll show this one. Now, I have to explain, this is actually, I'm, I'm um, part of the blame for confusing evolutionary issues with developmental issues, um, which are something now, with hindsight, I deeply regret. Um, there's a terrible muddle between the two now in much writing about this, and I'm partly to blame because this is a canned composite um, animation. It contains both elements, both one, uh, the growth sequence that it went through every, every iteration of the program, plus its evolution over the whole thing of the exhibition. Actually, what you're seeing is really the evolution of it. But it looked like that each day as it went through its developmental stage. And interestingly, this led to a lot of misunderstanding, but it's interesting that the history of biology made the same mistake. There is a, um, um, a famous saying in biology which is untrue. And what it says is that um, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. The theory was that the fetus, as it grew from this little little fish-like looking thing, went through all the, and it grew into a human being, it went through all the stages that, of, uh, that we went through in evolution as we developed from a more primitive form. It's a very, it's, it's a very nice misunderstanding. It's completely untrue. Um, ontogeny does not recapitulate phylogeny at all, but it looks as though it does. It's another of these lily book problems, basically. Same thing, it's a very close visual analogy, untrue. Um, so this is going through that same thing. It looks as if it's going through um, uh, a developmental sequence, but in fact what you're seeing here is evolution. This is a canned animation, the level of complexity it reached at the end of each day. I really regret this, and there's no way we can go back to the data to separate these two out now. Um, so we're, we're stuck, I'm stuck forever with this problem I've created. But the reason it's a problem is that people then talk about things which are only developmental as if they're evolutionary. 
and they use that word, you find it all over the place in the press, any issue of AD, and it's not. It's not evolutionary, they're mostly developmental. Or they're evolution in the loose sense, as I said yesterday, that you could say any set of sketches evolves. And of course, in that loose sense of the language, of course, it's true. So that's what we managed to evolve over uh, three weeks of the exhibition. And what was it evolving for? And the answer is increasing complexity. Learning from that experiment that went wrong, the yellow one I just showed you, we turned that mess into advantage and said, well, look, if we, instead of trying to produce something that's simplified, we, everybody assumes always that it's evolving from here to here. And that's actually the case. So we basically played on that and said, okay, evolve for increasing, um, increasing complexity. So that's what it was doing. So it was selecting each day. And I'm going to explain how this selection process, I'm going to explain that, um, that that's Thursday. For the moment, I want to make a more general point. Um, this is several computers combining to do this. Um, instead of talking to an environment, which are, they're simulating it, and that's just the, the, that was just the next step in that process. The reason we're showing that is I'm moving to a situation where I'm looking to have lots of different buildings that might be evolving, not just in isolation, but talking to each other. So that if we've got, say, a model over here, one building evolving, and another model here evolving, that the two cooperate and discuss their adjacency or whatever, co-evolution. Um, now, here's a piece of software that actually generalizes this. Um, don't uh, try to ignore the forms. Well, it's a bit difficult, actually. Um, but they are being um, partly selected by I, and partly, like Ron Holland, and partly from the algorithm. Um, but this is a piece of software we wrote in Hong Kong um, jointly with a uh, um, a professor I had a sort of visiting research fellow, um, and I wrote the specification for this, but he wrote the actual code. And these particular demonstrations are just the research assistants um, picking um, examples. And I hope Chinese colleagues won't be offended if I said that, that they had a sort of predilection for pagoda-like forms. So <laughs> they were tending to print it. So the point about this is that none of these have been designed, as you can probably tell me. But they, they, they have all emerged from the application of these algorithms. And sometimes producing very surprising results, like where, where you get these inter, interweaving, interweaving forms. The point about this is just to demonstrate that you don't have to make blobs. In this case, you can make pagodas instead. You can make but it's to do with, with the rules you put into it. These pieces of software are very powerful indeed. You can do thousands of these iterations in a few minutes. And you can get the software, you can either select the ones you want yourself to breed, or you can get the software to select them for you and show you just the limited number. And the professor who's doing this for me is a world's expert in optimization theory. So that what they're set up to do um, is to optimize for things like solar geometry, uh, wind behavior, uh, matter of enclosure, anything that you can write into these algorithms it's set up to do. And there are um, 40,000 parameters controlling this geometry. And sometimes it really does surprise you. You know, you get up in the morning and say, what's it done? And they say, well, look what, you know. And sometimes it just has a bad hairdo day. And sometimes it gets stuck in a rut, and sometimes it goes back to things. But what you do is you keep a gene pool, and I, I'll explain that when I, when I show the diagrams of the genes, so that you don't just keep just two genes, you, you have a whole pool of these so that you can re-find earlier ones. But all these things have been invented by the software. Nobody put this in. This is the bit I'm trying to explain. But it, it didn't get like this because somebody thought of it. It got like that because someone selected particular things and crossbred them or was putting it in for particular kinds of characteristic it was looking for. This is what happens when we let Chris Muller loose on it. Now, Chris Muller um, runs an architectural practice that was, did the Siboga program at uh, Project at um, Groningen that I mentioned yesterday. Um, now, these sites here are in fact four vacant plots in Siboga on which Chris was proposing building towers. One of the, uh, not, sorry, not Arnsberg, near Siboga. Um, when I explain more fully the Groningen model and how 
um, the citizens can interact with this. One of the things it does is a what-if kind of prediction, and it shows what would happen. And one of the things that we experimented with was, say, um, restricting pedestrian, um, restricting car access in the city centre, making it pedestrian only. And the result of that was that you would get very high growth immediately near. And Chris started exploring this. So these are supposed to be four towers. But what's happened at this stage is it's decided to join them together. So here are two outputs from that program. The footprint at the bottom of these two is identical. But the software has merged the towers. This is a result of this idea that the different buildings should cooperate. In this case, what the software decided to do as a result of the cooperation was to make them into one building after they came up a certain height. Now, this, I think, would be fair to describe this as emergent emergent behavior. So now there's a bit of a race on to see who first constructs um, constructs a building. Now what I've just done on the, on the train, I was going to show and decided not to, is this already been done with things like telephone handsets and controllers. I might show that before the end. But there are already objects on this planet which were never designed by anybody. I mean, you could say that's true anyways, of course. Um, but things that, that might. This was designed by a designer. Um, but the ones that look remarkably like it, which weren't. Um, and I, I, but it's trivially easy because it's a small, defined object. Now, what happens when you come to a building? So, um, that, I'm just trying to show what other people do with this same software. It's a very, very powerful tool, but that's all I want to say about it for the moment. Because it doesn't have to make free-form buildings at all. And this is um, another student. This one's a student called Patrick Janssen using two things now simultaneously in this. First, the little spheres I showed a moment ago, which is called an isospatial data structure, is being used in this, but you can't see it anymore because they're just little dots, and they're controlling, in fact. There's one of these dots at every vertex in this building, and there's one in the middle of each plane, and there's one in the middle of each space. And those cells are working the same way as that blob just evolved, exactly the same way, but this time it's controlling a rectangular uh, orthogonal output. But that wasn't designed by anyone, nor was that, nor was that. These are variants being developed by the software. <coughs> All those never designed by anybody. Here it comes. It starts a pack of cubes. And it's going to work out the circulation. It's working out the circulation from the, from the requirements. The staircase has gone in the circulation. It's massed the building. It's carved some holes in it. And it's now going to add the fenestration. And then you take that. That only takes the computer about that long. Um, and this obviously slowed down so you can see it. You now have got 50 variants. You now evaluate each of these. That then goes into a solar um, and environmental performance evaluation package, which then tries to optimize the design and repeat, repeats it. Now, I just wanted to say just a few words, or begin to say a little bit about um, what happens when um, someone like Gary uses this kind of software. He's not using, let me be clear, the generative thing at the minute. You've now got to connect two lines of thought which are running independently at the minute. But all these things are converging. Gary can only put up buildings like this because he's got the computer models that model to very fine tolerances the titanium surface here. The titanium surface and tolerance are about two millimeters. Um, the steelwork framing behind is grossly out of tolerance, um, and therefore there are special ways of getting the two to marry up again, which I will explain tomorrow. Um, the point at the moment is just to say that it's the same as the Ron Holland story. You can't make this. You can't, you, he's back in control of the process as, uh, as the sort of master craftsman, really, because they have control of the, of, the, of the computer systems. And I also mentioned that Charles Jetson mischievously said that that was the first building to be generated from a computer model. This is, again, I repeat, not true. This was not a generated computer model. That was done by Frank doing this with pieces of paper, just like Ron Holland, and inputting that data into the model. It was constructed in part from a computer model. But in that case, it's not the first one, because actually it was the fish, the big fish in Barcelona, which was actually the first building 
to be constructed from one of these models at the level of driving the CNC machinery. You see, you're not taking the drawings. They don't exist. You're taking the instructions, just like the instructions to cut the boat, laser cut the boat ribs. The instructions are going straight to the machinery. So you, you, there are no drawings in between. It goes straight from the model to the thing. So the process is bent piece of paper, computer model of bent piece of paper, actual fabricated titanium to a big scale. Nothing in between. And that's crucial because it means you've got control of the exact nature of these services. Imagine how awful this would look if it was being interpreted in between by a normal building process. So it enabled it. So Jenks is half right, but not completely. It was not generated, and it wasn't the first. Um, but it's the only way to make these things economical. This is starter. The only reason that these very complex forms are economically possible and viable is because the data is coming straight from the computer model. And that means there are less errors on site. That means the costing's accurate, and so on. And the thing that shocks everyone is to discover that the Starter building in MIT is only average price for a building of this square footage in America University. It's not expensive at all. And the, both the Disney Concert Hall and um, the Guggenheim Museum were built to cost. Um, these are not expensive. And why? Because it's in control. Now, now comes the power and the twist and the danger, in one, all in one go. This hole in the ground in Hong Kong epitomizes this, this dilemma that's got to be resolved. This is not a very interesting building going out of this hole, but the process is devastating. This actually isn't the first building to be built generated either, but this is the first building to be completely built from a computer model. There are no drawings at all. All the specification, all the costing, all the tendering, all the fabrications coming straight off the model. That is nothing else in between. Now, what does that do? First, it empowers the architect potentially if the architect's in control of the process. So, the power end of this is, and the, the beautiful end is, if you link what I've just shown you with the, with the other piece of software, and you imagine that generating this model, then you have a fantastic potential future scenario. However, this model was not developed by the architects. It was developed by the developers. It's a not very interesting, sorry, I better not just say that. It's a typical Hong Kong office block, 80-something stories. It was developed by the property developers, Swire Properties, who own Cafe Pacifica and so on. Swire did this model, and they own this model. Now, the implications of this are unbelievable, because, first of all, it, it's so successful for them that they are already employing it on the next project in China, over the border, although it's only a hole in the ground in Hong Kong. They've already saved so much money. But the other thing is, it means they own the copyright, so they can produce variants on this. So they can template it, they can clone it. It's back to the, back to the pattern books, but in 3D. Uh, uh, in some ways, this absolutely horrifies me. On the other hand, the potential for architects to be involved, if they understand what they're is fabulous, because you can start linking this to the generative software, and then you can start making these models. However, if they let this happen, let the developers have it, the architects are going to be downgraded in the process till they barely exist. This is the computer model. It's the most complex building computer model that I know of, um, built using um, um, Katia software, or a development of it, for, for Frank Gehry. Frank Gehry is not the architect, I hasten to add, of course. However, Gary Technologies um, are doing, uh, they basically put the model together for the property development. So you can cut it, you can section it, 80 stories of it, and then you start putting all the services in. Now, this is where the nightmare starts for the architect. Um, just out of interest, you know, if you just think, think what, what it would require to, 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 to put this data in and be in control of it. But the architect, if the architect isn't in control of it, they're lost. So this is where I see the scenario, the need for change of rules to become paramount. It's going to be forced. So I take the initiative and, and, and drive it the way it could be driven. So this becomes a fantastic opportunity. Well, I'll finish up like this project with the architect being devalued down to the same level as the person making the tea. 
um, you go there, this is, this is it. This is the building. It's a model of itself. And there is nothing else. There's no drawing, nothing. And they're constructing it. It's going up. So they do the tendering. And the, whoever's doing the, the fabrication, the duct work, just extracts that data. And it goes straight to the machines that start to cut up the steel, go straight to the costing. You get the costing out. Anyway, it can't get the quantities of anything, the size of anything. So it's an opportunity to make more economic buildings, better design buildings. The building can go into these iterative cycles to start to evaluate it better. And we'll come back to that point. On, so on the one hand, fabulous opportunity. On the other hand, this is quite horrendous. I just wonder what, how it impacts on your own. I mean, how do people around the room reckon they can actually put together a model like this? So I confidently expect um, uh, that they will all level in, a big developer. Other developers in Hong Kong are already looking at this and copying it. This has been looked at in Australia. Uh, one of the prestigious new buildings in London may go up doing this process as an experiment. You'll soon find in, in Singapore, the building regulations what require you to put the drawings in now in a manner which in, contains intelligence which the software can read to automatically check the drawings against the building regulations, the building codes, fire escape, and thermal environmental performance. That will go into building regulations in Hong Kong very soon. Then you won't be able to build a building unless you can put the data in in this form. But no good sending a drawing. Forget it. So it's a threat. It's a threat to the way people did work, and it's a fantastic opportunity to work differently and empower architects to have access to these tools. But it means understanding the fundamental process. And I say this is nothing. This is just the, 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 the mechanics of it. What actually you need to do now is understand the, the power of the software of the generative stuff we've just shown. Now you can imagine this being driven by um, the piece of software that's making those towers, say, just shown. See, that can plug into these models and start generating these these structures. There's no reason whatever why the, the software that did those tasks can't generate every part of this totally automatically. Now I'm back to my seed. Remember how lazy I am? I didn't want to put all that data. I never going to put all that data in anything, but I can describe it in, in generic terms, in DNA-like terms, and then let the software do it all. Just do it by rules. I didn't want to have to sit there. I just imagine, you know. Ah, um, interesting, one, one little two-second two digression, I'm going to stop. Um, the transputer, which was the first chip to, uh, that, that was so complex it couldn't be designed by hand anymore. Um, if you produce a, a, a plot-out drawing, I lost my drawing here, like this, um, from floor to ceiling, you can just see the line, the gaps, the line, between the lines where the gaps and the tracking on the, on the chip went. And its actual size is eight millimeters. It was the first chip. Nowadays, all chips are designed by computer. You can't design them by hand. Um, but the person who wrote the software to do that was an architect. And why did they employ an architect? The answer was beautiful. Because they all knew about writing the software, but they just couldn't even begin to see how to conceptualize the problem of trying to organize a chip for the complexity. And then I've forgotten how complicated it was. It was something like a two billion logic gates. How to organize two billion logic gates? Architect? No trouble, because he immediately had to do it. And he laid this out like a city, and he talked of it in those ways. Oh, here are the main highways, over here is memory area. And he talked about it as if he's living inside this late millimeter chip. And fantastic kind of three-dimensional visualization of this space. And he developed the software, which developed that. I would say we've now got to the point historically where buildings like this you cannot design by hand. It's impossible. There's no going back, and nobody would be stupid enough to start sitting out and trying to do this, surely, would they, by hand? Um, so I think it's going to have to be automated. Now, so that is either good or bad. So I don't know who's driving, how did the data get in? And I'm suggesting that the data could get in totally automatically. But what we should stay with is the things we're preoccupied by, the interaction environment, the space, the interaction with people, not at the level of, of fiddling with these drawings. Otherwise, you're into a nightmare scenario. Which do you want? Um, so tomorrow, we have the building's tale. What's the building got to say about all this? And what does the building know about itself? Because the building has an interesting tale to tell too, and another twist to all this, including how we're going to construct these buildings from all this data, and what went wrong, and to a little bit of time, what went wrong at previous attempts to do this, and why they were ill-conceived, and what's different now that will change it. And then on Thursday, 
we will explain some of those computer techniques and expand on what the computer could add to all this. And then on Friday, the environment um, is, 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 is gets its say about how all this could interact with the environment. And finally, the storyteller gets the chance to put it all together. That's the last thing that's going to happen on Friday. And I'm going to put all, this, all these tales together. And I'm, I'm, I'm starting to put some of them together, but loosely. And put this together so it hangs together, I hope, as one coherent story. And then I'm uh, over to you to say, well, you know, would you like to rewrite the ending? Would you like to change the text? Do you have another story? Um, and the person who put these images up for me invented some extra tales, which I might draw three more on her version, one of which was the dreamer's tale. Um, we have no dreamer's tale in this set of lectures. Maybe there should be. Uh, maybe there are some missing elements. So there might be missing elements. There might be alternative sto endings. There might be alternative stories. But everyone, I think, I hope, will have their own story um, and, and come to terms with at least asking the questions about what are you going to do about resources? What are you going to do about people? What are you going to do about interacting with socially, economically, what are you going to do about the way the, in the construction industry is changing globally, and so on. <clears throat> okay, thank you.